and welcome to The Spectrum Show. Welcome to this end of series special, and we have a real mixed bag for you in this episode, as we normally do for the last in the series, and this makes it a little bit longer than normal, so sit back and enjoy. If you haven't already realised yet, I love Spectrums. My first 48K rubber keyed model saw me through many years. The massive choice of games was staggering, and there was always something special just on the horizon. There was, as you will no doubt know, also some real stinkers. C-Tech Software, or to give them their full name, Control Technology, was set up by Shirley Fenton and Richard Cheatham, both 21-year-olds who had recently finished university. The company were well known, but sadly for the wrong reasons. They were notorious for producing terrible games. The most famous, of course, being Crazy Kong, but we'll come on to that shortly. But what about the others? Were all c -Tech's games terrible? There was a lot of them, which surprised me, and they also released a lot of compilations, sometimes renaming games, either due to copyright or to make the public think they were getting a different game altogether. c -Tech started advertising around 1981 under the name Control Technology, selling their ZX81 titles along with games for the Atom and VIC-20. In July 1982, they made an announcement that they would soon be selling games for the ZX Spectrum. The following month, they began to advertise their first foray into the Spectrum world the Spectrum Arcade Pack. The games included were Avalanche, Lunar Lander, Missile Command, Pattern and Plano. Sadly, Avalanche, Pattern and Plano are missing in action, so let's take a look at the others. First of all, Lunar Lander. The game available separately on World of Spectrum is not the one from SeaTech. To get that, you have to load the Spectrum Arcade Pack and wait for what seems like an eternity before you can get the proper game. This poor basic game is the usual lander affair. You have to land your module on the surface, in a safe place, and to do this you have to use left, right and your thrusters to control your speed. If you hit the land too quickly, you'll explode. However, no matter how often I tried, I exploded anyway. The graphics are typical typing quality. The module jerks about, and the sound is just a beeper. No fun at all. On to Missile Command then. Yes, a clone of the arcade game, and a pretty bad one. For a start, the border continually changes colour, inducing headaches. The inbound missiles are drawn really slowly, and there's no smooth movement whatsoever. The crosshair moves in character squares, and firing just produces a beep and an attribute flash. The collision detection is also way off at times. The cities you're supposed to protect are just blocks, and the whole thing is just awful. The game goes into some kind of beeper symphony of crap music when the missiles land. Again, no fun to play. The next month, September 1982, more games arrived along with the request for users to send in their games for publication. Polecat. This was described as a completely original and ingenious maze game. Hmm, not really. It's just the standard game where an enemy homes in on you. In this case you control a rabbit head. No idea what happened to its body. 
You have to eat the carrots and avoid the chasing polecat. That looks more like a small kangaroo. This basic game has flickering graphics, poor control, terrible sound and is just dull. And those tunes drive you mad. Next we have Breakout, and I think we all know what to expect here. Running in at a massive 3K of pure basic, this typical Breakout game is nothing special. It works, sort of, the graphics and sound are poor, and there are hundreds of other similar games like this available as typings across many magazines. And talking of typings, the next game is Bomber, also known as City Bomber. Oh god, SeaTech have released a standard bomber game. This one doesn't even auto run, and yes it's in basic, about 4k of basic to be exact. Again there are hundreds of types of these games in magazine listings, and again it's nothing special. I can't believe SeaTech were selling this. On to Fruit Machine then, and yes, there's plenty of these around in magazines too. And again, no auto run. And again, basic. For a basic game, free to type in, this wouldn't have been bad. But to buy it, really, it seems crazy. There are hold and nudge options, but that's about as much as I can say about this one. On to Crazy Race, and another basic game, running in at 4.7k. If you break into the game, the listing even has a different name, Death Driver. And in the save routine, it calls it Carrera. So a game with three names then. It seems you have to drive around the circuit, knocking over people and dogs, whilst avoiding the other stationary cars. What a rather odd game. It's fun for about 30 seconds, I suppose, if you don't think it's a bit sick having to drive over people and kill dogs. On to Sub Hunt then. The game starts and nothing happens. You have to press a key and then you get flickering submarines across the screen. And another press of the key and we get some instructions. And another press of the key and finally into the game. Your helicopter moves constantly across the screen. Below are two submarines and you have to drop depth charges on them. You can move up and down and obviously drop the depth charge. The subs gradually move up the screen, and when they reach the top, they will destroy your helicopter. This is just so basic in both senses of the word, and again a typical type-in. Nothing really special. The thing was, at this time in history, other companies were selling full machine code games, not hastily thrown together, badly written basic attempts. November arrives, and we see Control Technology shoveling all previous games into one package, named the Spectrum Video Pack. We also see the name change here to the shorter C-Tech, and they've also started to advertise Dragon Software. Christmas arrives, and this marked an appearance of two new games, Crazy Kong and Panic Island. Crazy Kong, 
Oh no, do I really have to play this again? Cue the terrible intro sequence. The game loading is terrible. It asks you to put the computer into caps mode and then a screen loads and then some data loads and then nothing happens and then you press a key and you're into the game at last. The control is awful. There are different keys for moving and jumping. So you have one key to move right and another key to jump right, which really doesn't work. Barrels and fireballs rain down and the collision detection is so bad it's laughable. Sometimes a barrel will kill you, other times it won't. Key response is a thing made in hell and frustrates you no end. Many players gave up on this game, myself included. The original advert claimed the game had machine code subroutines, but strangely enough this changed to a 100% machine code game in later ads. It also claimed it had three screens of high resolution graphics, but no, the game has a bug that means that when you do complete level 2, it loops back to level 1. Now, I discovered something interesting during this part. The game on the compilation with Panic Island is different to the one released on its own. The scoring and lives are in a different place. Could this mean this version will let you get onto level 3? Alas, it seems even more broken than the first one. You can't even get to level 2. On the original, once you got to the top platform, you went to level 2. On this version, you can get onto the top platform and move left and right, and even try and climb the ladder, but this just kills you. A totally frustrating game then that many suspect is compiled basic, and one to keep away from if you want to keep your sanity. On to the game that came with it then, Panic Island. The game has a scroll prompt in the opening screen, which doesn't bode well really. You have to move around an island collecting treasure and avoiding zombies. If you make a zombie collide with a tree, it will kill it. Oh dear, what a terrible game. It keeps playing a tune every time you collect some gold and stops the whole game while you're doing it. And when you kill a zombie, the game stops again just to tell you. And then resets all of the trees, zombies and gold. When you collect enough treasure, the game stops to tell you. This game certainly likes to stop a lot. What a poor game. It's just a standard chase game written in basic. For the last 8 months or so, CTEC had full page adverts in your computer, but as 1983 arrived, they vanished for a month. But they were back in February, this time with full colour adverts, and 3 new games added to their catalogue. Gorfian Invaders. This was a cross between Space Invaders and Gorf, I suppose. There are long periods of nothingness, just a black screen, with no instructions. And then the game asks you to press S. But you can't press S, you have to actually press Cap Shift and S. And then the game begins, and you wish it hadn't really. Small, jerky graphics, bad sound, and awful controls. The left key moves you up as well, putting you in danger. The right key just moves you right, which is very odd. You can press the down key to get your ship back to the bottom of the screen, but as soon as you press the left key again, back up you go. The advert claims four screens, but I couldn't get past the first one, so I used an infinite lice poke. And on the second level, there are three red things. If you get past this, you then get onto a laughable mothership. And if you get past that, you go back to screen one. So again, there's no fourth screen. This sounds very similar to the claims made about Crazy Kong. Moving on, and Frogger was another one of the new games. It's basic, running in at 8k. The control is awful, and can take nearly a second to respond sometimes. The game is split across two screens, the first being a road with lots of various cars. Once across this, which is usually easily enough, 
as long as you can line up the pass at the other end, the whole game then stops for about 15 seconds. No idea why, and then eventually you get onto the next stage, and here you have to cross the river using logs and turtles. The graphics are large, but blocky, and movement is terrible. The movement is in character jumps, sound is crap. Getting the frog into the actual space at the end is at times impossible due to the movement. It's a bit of an improvement over previous games, I suppose, but not very much. Next, on to another arcade clone in Specman. I bet you can all guess what this one is. According to the advert, though, this is probably the best version of the game. Let's see. Mm, nope, definitely not. Control is terrible, graphics and sound are awful, the game stops to play sounds, and you can even get the sudden death syndrome. If you play on the high levels, you get more ghosts to chase you, and they'll kill you pretty quickly. The ghosts just home in on your position, so all in all, this is rubbish. March arrived and another full page, full colour advert appeared, this time in a different style, and also featuring a new game, Centipede. They also bundled Specman and Frogger together here. Centipede, yes, another dull, tedious introduction, and yes, you have to sit through all of this. Once into the game, we get the normal run-of-the-mill centipede clone. Despite the instructions saying that you can move up and down, no keys seem to do that. And then I realised I'd loaded the 16k version. You have to be careful, because there are both versions on the tape. One is for 16k users, and the other for 48k users. The 16k version does not let you move up and down, as I found out. There's also no spider, and some sound effects are missing. For a better version, load the 48k one. The graphics are still character based, the sound is ok and better than the 16k version, control is responsive, and this is the best CTEC game so far in my opinion, and at least it's not basic. However, it is very tricky to play, and it's certainly a challenge. Around May 1983, games players were discovering the delights of Crazy Kong, and articles appeared in magazines showing their displeasure. Undeterred, SeaTech marched on, and a few months idled by, and in June 1983, they launched their new style inlays and bundles. Super Centipede and Painter got thrown together. Super Centipede is the 48k version of the previously released game, so let's have a look at Painter. Strangely, when you actually load the game, it's called Time Bomb. You control a man who has to disarm bombs in the correct order. This means just running around, collecting the numbers in sequence, making sure you don't cross your own trail. A basic game, both in gameplay and the language it was written in. The graphics are jerky, the sound is bad, and the gameplay is dull. Looking at the advert and Frogger was still with Specman, and Crazy Kong got stuck on its own. They were also starting to push Dragon Software too, a game called Fighter Pilot and City Bomber. Let's hope City Bomber was better than the one on the Spectrum. They also announced in full page glory a brand new game called Rocket Raider. SeaTech themselves claimed it would beat Arcadia and Penetrator in the charts. This game was at least playable, and is, to be honest, not a bad game at all. It's a sort of cross between Defender and Scramble. You fly around an alien landscape and have to kill all the little red alien chaps. There are rockets that launch upward, very similar to Scramble, but the movement of your ship is more like Defender. You can thrust and change direction. 
Movement is in character squares though, but the gameplay is good despite this. Sound-wise it more or less runs in silence. There's some almost inaudible clicks as you fly, there's nothing for shooting or bombing, but you do get some strange effect when you crash. But then again, this is a 16k game. This is definitely the best C-Tech game, and not surprising really when you look at the author. Nigel Alderton, who later went on to write such classics as Chucky Egg, Commando and Ghosts and Goblins. C-Tech, alongside Rocket Raider, also announced a new game called Knocker Blocker, a game that sees the player knocking nails into something before monsters catch him. Which sounds very odd to me. This game was never released, or at least it was the last C-Tech game and no one wanted to buy it. In September, Computer and Video Games pulled together all the complaints it had received and put them to C-Tech. In response, Shirley Fenton brushed off the complaints, claiming the game was their best seller, and went on further to threaten the magazine, saying that C-Tech would stop all advertising with them if they published any letters. This is very odd because C-Tech didn't actually advertise in Computer and Video Games. At least I couldn't find any going back eight months or so. This just leaves one mystery then a game called Astro Scramble. Although listed on several websites like World of Spectrum as being a C-Tech game, I couldn't find any adverts for it at all. There's a tape inlay that says it came with something called Taxman, and the inlay does look like the adverts for Gorfian Invaders, but I guess we'll never know. By the end of 1983, C-Tech adverts had dried up. They produced no more games. They pushed Rocket Raider, Crazy Kong and Panic Island into a compilation although I have no evidence of this, and the company silently slipped away into gaming history, leaving their games for others to judge them by. So if they're the bad games, what makes a good game? makes a good game. Every person is different and every person has their own opinions about what makes a game good. Some are drawn to crisp, well-defined and smooth moving graphics, while for others that's not really important. Hercules Slayer of the Damned for example has excellent large graphics, but the gameplay is terrible, so in this case the graphics don't make the game great. On the flip side there's Myth. Again, with slick, beautiful animated graphics and a deep, engrossing game. There are many instances of games that are addictive and challenging but have terrible graphics. Mushroom Man is one such game. A simple yet clever puzzle game with the most basic of graphics. They are the normal 8 pixel square user definable type, but the game is not about the look, it's about solving puzzles. Moving on to the learning curve and how quickly and easily a player can get into the game. Take Space Invaders for example, a classic arcade game with multiple clones on the spectrum. The simple controls and simple gameplay make this a joy to play and you don't have to work out key combinations or trawl through documentation to actually enjoy it. Are the number of keys linked to how good a game is? d Ant Attack is a classic example of a game with multiple keys and yet remains uncomplex and easy to play, with an inviting learning curve. The first person you rescue is a few paces inside the city wall, and this gets the player used to moving and jumping. As the game progresses, the location of the stranded person becomes trickier to navigate, and the use of grenades becomes essential. I would say this game provides an almost perfect learning curve. Nightlore is well known for breaking the mould in the Spectrum world with its brilliant isometric graphics and beautifully drawn sprites, yet the game has quite a steep learning curve when you think about it. Not only do you have to contend with the 3D environment, but there are also multiple keys, object manipulation, random enemy movement and spatial awareness to take into account. Yes it looks good, but for me the game throws a player in far too deep far too quickly. 
So far we've focused on graphics, but what about sound? The Spectrum had limited capability where noise was concerned, but correct and clever use of it could improve a game. To make my point, try playing any of your favourite games without any sound, and you'll soon realise just how much it adds to the overall experience. Of course, some games produced an awful racket, and even the best games can suffer from bad sound. Constantly playing music was a novelty when it first appeared in Matthew Smith's excellent Manic Miner, but after playing the game for 30 minutes, it can soon get on your nerves. Luckily though, you can turn it off. We've already mentioned multiple controls, but this can also play a part in how a game feels and how easy it is to adjust to playing it. There are several standard control models for games depending on what type of game it is. The most basic left, right and fire, or jump, is usually used for shooters or platform games, like Space Invaders for example, and the aforementioned Manic Miner. These few keys are easy to remember and put the focus on the game. You don't have to look down at the keyboard once your fingers are in place, and that helps a great deal. The next model is left, right, up, down and fire, or jump and is used in a wide variety of game styles like Cookie, Sewer Age and Genesis Dawn of a New Day. The usual key layout for this is Q, A, O, P and M, which is an easy position to get your hands in and feels natural when playing, and again this model puts the focus on the game. So far the two models mentioned are also easily playable with a joystick, which is very important. Early Spectrum games did not have a joystick option, because joysticks were not commonplace. As they became more available, and standards like Kempston emerged, more games adopted the model, and having a game with five primary controls meant it was easily translated. Anything above that would require additional keys, which meant the player had to not only remember which key to use, but also it meant moving their hands and fingers away from the main ones. This could impact on gameplay, and move the focus away from what was happening on screen, and onto the keyboard. This model usually decreases enjoyment of the game in proportion to the number of extra keys required. So far I have been basing this article on action games, where the fewer keys required to control the player, the better they experience. However, there are other game types where multiple keys would not distract too much, and these usually fall into the RPG or strategy formats, for example Lords of Midnight where accurate control and fast reactions are not required. This does not mean, though, that a key layout becomes less important. If a game requires multiple keys, then having appropriate commands connected to them becomes important. For example, it would be considered bad practice to have the map key on anything other than the M. Using command initials for control makes remembering them easier. Allowing users to redefine keys themselves is also important, as many players prefer different layouts especially now that games play on emulators rather than the original hardware. Does a good story help a game? Well, I suppose it depends on the type of game. For a shooter, there's very little point in having large detailed story. Who wants that when there are aliens to blast? However, entering an adventure such as Valhalla without knowing what you're supposed to do would be pretty pointless. What about characters then? There have been many memorable characters on the spectrum. Horace, Minor Willy, Ziggy, Monty Mole, Dizzy and Egghead just to name a few. Do these help sell games? Absolutely. Do they make them better? Not really. A good character always helps a game, especially if the control model remains the same. This helps the player get straight into things, and if the gameplay is the same but with different locations, Dizzy is a good example of this and all the better. Game players have a wide range of skills, from the hardcore gamer who can complete Jet Set Willy every time, to the absolute beginner who can't get past the first screen in Manic Miner. Catering for all skill sets has been a problem for gamers since gaming began. Make the game too easy and it gets completed quickly and the player feels cheated. Make it too hard and you lose the less skilled players very early on. Having different skill levels is a good option here and allows the game to be played at different levels. This also helps extend the game's life, 
as once you have completed it on the easy level, you can move up and try it on the harder ones. Many games like Bear Bother have a training level where the player can get to grips with the controls without being killed, and this is another good way to tackle the difficulty problem. The earliest game I could find to include this type of option was Black Hole by Quest Microsystems. Sound, graphics, keys, difficulty, all focusing on the actual game itself. But what about packaging? Certainly some of the earlier games had terrible inlays, but releases from Quicksilver or Ocean had some really outstanding artwork. Would this affect the game though is a difficult question. It should help the player get involved and provide a nice atmosphere. Remember, inlays were often read and examined closely during the loading process, unlike today's emulation. Good artwork for me certainly helps to make a game better. Along similar lines are licensed tie-ins. Many of the later Spectrum games had tie-in to films, like Batman, Robocop and Ghostbusters for example, or arcade games like Double Dragon, Chase HQ and Outrun. This is a very dangerous area, as can be seen by the last game mentioned there, Outrun. With licenses the player already has expectations, they know what the arcade game is or how the film is, and how it plays and looks, so they anticipate what the Spectrum release will be. Obviously they know it won't be an exact copy due to the machine's limitations, but if a company puts out a slow, badly written game, sales will suffer. Using a film license is a little less dangerous, as the player has nothing to compare it with, other than the celluloid image. The developers have artistic license to work around the film and produce something that links into it. This does not mean sticking to the film pace explicitly, as many Indiana Jones games can testify. The arcade adventure games for the Spectrum were, for me, a little disappointing, forcing a platform game into the film story. However, the excellent LucasArts adventures that later appeared on the PC were brilliant. Another subject away from the actual game is advertising and hype. Many companies spent huge budgets on advertising their games with full colour, double page, glossy spreads. But this also had a disadvantage. A good example of this can be found in CTEX games. They advertised arcade perfect, fast machine code games with brilliant graphics, but the user got poorly written games with abysmal playability. Balancing players' expectations is a magic art and has to be taken very seriously if you want to succeed. Company size will get a small mention at this point, but to be honest this really doesn't matter. Take Phoenix by Megadodo Software as a prime example. Small, one-man company, great game. On the flip side, Activision, with a multi-million pound budget, has produced some poor efforts. To conclude this whole ramble then, what makes a good game? Well to be honest, no one knows for sure. With mixtures of all the previously mentioned things having different effects on different people. What would be easier to conclude is what makes a bad game, but then we enter a whole new realm of discussion. The game style defines the importance of graphics, sound and control mechanism. Get it wrong for any mixture of these and the game will suffer. Imagine a fast paced arcade action game with 10 different control keys. Good programming and general game design along with level design, if appropriate, is important and it will be the difference in the player giving up in frustration or going back for just one more go. Maintaining a character is obviously also a good move if the games are successful, and not using them in something totally different where their embedded control and movement has already been established. Story and advertising is a fine balance, and although not important to the same level as the other elements discussed here, they can, if used correctly, make a difference. They prepare the player for their gaming experience in different ways, and when done badly, can actually let the player down before they even get into the game. A prime example of this is the rather odd Motorcycle Crazy, which looks like an exciting action game, but is in fact a rather poor adventure. Using expensive licenses is obviously a good selling point, as the majority of the hype and advertising is done by the film itself, but there's a fine line between good and bad tie-ins, and a poor rushed game, regardless of the film, will do badly. What makes a good game then is a clever mixture of everything that's been mentioned here and is intrinsically linked to the individual. You will never please all of the people all of the time, as the saying goes, and this was never more true than when talking about games. Even armed with some ideas about what you liked in games, you were still caught out from time to time though. It wouldn't have been so bad if it wasn't for the cost and loading times. You'd pay out £10, get back home, throw the tape in your player and wait, and wait, and wait a bit more, and then, 
the game turned out to be absolute garbage. That's five minutes of your life you'll never get back. Of course, things improved with disk drives, but it wasn't until emulation arrived in the early 90s that loading games wasn't so much of a chore. And not to mention the free availability of most titles back then. And this got me thinking again about all the emulators that I used to use, all the different hardware that I used to run them on, and wouldn't it be a great idea to get the original hardware and try them out again? This was originally going to be a long feature about using old DOS emulators on real hardware. You know, the old 486 and early Pentium PCs, if you're young enough to remember those. However, things didn't go as planned as we shall see. First, obviously, I needed the hardware. The old laptop from episode 52 was useless because the floppy drive was broken, so transferring files was a bit too slow. I attacked this problem from two angles, thinking that at least one of them would work. First I scouted the old IT storage cupboard at work and found a Pentium laptop. This Dell Latitude C540 is a fully working Pentium 4 laptop. It's got a 2GHz processor, 512MB of RAM and a 20GB hard drive. At the same time I purchased a Compaq Evo 510 from eBay, with nearly the same specifications, but with the added advantage of having PCI slots in case I needed them later. Onto the laptop first, and it's not in bad condition considering it's over 10 years old, and it booted straight into XP. No good for what I needed, so I quickly flattened it and installed DOS 622. Once loaded and the CD drivers set up in config.sys and autoexec.bat, I swapped out the drives and rebooted with a pre-built CD containing all the emulators I was going to test. First was Z80. This ran OK in 48k mode and the games were running at full speed. Next it was on to X128, one of my favourites from back in the day. This failed to load, complaining that it could not locate the Sound Blaster card. The laptop didn't have a fully compatible sound card, and that kind of threw a spanner in the works. As I was trying to mess about with that, the Compaq arrived, and thinking this would be easier to set up, I set about removing Windows XP from that and installing DOS. Or at least I tried to, the floppy drive was dead. quick look inside and I found that the data cable wasn't connected. But even with it all plugged back in, the drive just didn't work. Luckily I had a USB floppy drive on hand, and that let me install DOS 622 and the CD drivers, along with all the emulators I needed. Again X128 still complained that it couldn't find a Sound Blaster card, as well as saying there wasn't enough memory in the machine. I swapped out the memory to give me 512 megabytes, and this sorted that little problem out, but the sound was still an issue. I checked the BIOS, and there was no real settings other than to disable the onboard sound. I did this and found a real Sound Blaster card, plugged it in, and tried again. Upon trying to install the DOS drivers, it said it couldn't find the card, which was odd because I know this card works. Next plan was to install Windows 98 to see if that could solve the sound problems. I didn't want to go down this route, but I'd put so much time in so far, it was the next logical step. Once installed, I then had to search for the drivers for the video card and chipset. With all this in place, it still didn't pick up the Sound Blaster card. It just indicated an unknown multimedia device. I loaded the drivers and this failed, still saying it couldn't find the card. Hmm, interesting. So I swapped out the card for a different type, a Hercules Muse XL. And again, this failed to pick up the card. It seemed, after a lot of messing about, that despite the BIOS saying that I'd disabled the onboard sound card, it was in fact still enabled. This conflicted with the settings of the Sound Blaster, and therefore this was not going to work. At this point I packed it in for the day. Back to the laptop, and Windows 98. Installation went OK, and once again I had to find the video drivers and chipset drivers and I installed Windows 98 Second Edition, which hopefully would improve detection of things like sound cards. Once the sound drivers were installed, I had at last sound, but only in Windows. Running X128 still caused the error, no sound blaster found. Uh, back into the BIOS and nothing to change there. Reading the X128 documentation, it noted that it can only pick up sound cards using IRQ 0-7, 
and looking at the settings on the laptop, it was set to IRQ11, with no real way to change it. Hmm, X128 was just not happy. I decided to continue and test some of the other emulators, and to be honest it was a pretty mixed bag. JPP loaded, but was far too fast to be of any use. The speed limited version, PJPP, loaded, but when I pressed F3 to load again, it just crashed. Z80 was fine. It was great to use this again. Although it didn't like multicoloured game engines for some reason. R80 loaded, but the sound was way off. Maybe again connected to the detection of a sound card. It handled multicolored games fine, but the laptop fan did go into overdrive. Yevo, a good DOS emulator, but it didn't like running under windows at all. Sometimes it just crashed altogether, and other times it just detected phantom key presses. Of the emulators I got to work, one which got my attention was Spec 256. This will run normal Spectrum games as you would expect, but it also allows graphic overlays, so you can run a fixed set of games with 256 colours. The games included a lot of popular titles, and my favourite, Jetpack. Let's have a go at this. Hmm, I'm not sure I like this to be honest. Yes, it's the same game, but I think the added colour takes something away from this classic. Try Night Law. Now this looks better. The colours have been well designed here and fit the game properly, and it's certainly got a lot of charm about it. It's Night Law, but with a new coat of paint. My time spent messing about with this old hardware was a mix of nostalgia and frustration. I don't remember things being this annoying back in the day. Maybe we're too spoilt by modern operating systems and new emulators. Oh well, back in the box with the compact and off to the tip, and the laptop goes back to work to be crushed. Remember folks, nostalgia isn't all it's cracked up to be. I didn't throw away my Compaq, I rebuilt it with Windows XP, swapped out the CD drive for a faster one, and it will be back in the show soon. With the Spectrum name still alive and new games coming out all the time, it's no surprise there are plenty of visitors to retro events up and down the country. Sadly, the Spectrum has declined in numbers at these shows, which is a great pity. A recent show in Blackpool was no different. There were the usual arcade machines, great to play and always busy. I grabbed some playtime on Juno first, Centipede, Gyrus, Asteroids and a few others. There were plenty of consoles too, 5 or 6 Mega Drives, the same number of NES and SNES machines, 
the same number of master systems too. Yes, there were limited numbers of some consoles, but these tended to be the expensive ones like the Jaguar or Super Famicom. And the Spectrum? Well, I counted just two machines, a Plus 3 and a good old rubber keyed 48k model. There were more Amigas than Spectrums, and this I think is a worrying trend. Maybe there just isn't the interest at these kind of shows, but these are retro game events and the spec had hundreds of classic games. These events are always enjoyable, even with only two Spectrums, and there were plenty of other things to keep me busy. And I won't mention the 30 minutes of footage I took, by mistake, of my legs walking all over the event. Well, I think I did a half decent job of stitching all that together into some kind of meaningful jumble of words at the end. No reviews though. Hmm, let's see what we can do about that. Do you find your expansion port needs expanding? Do you really crave a reset button to save pulling out the plug all the time? Well, this is the device for you. This is the Nid Valley Extender Bar. It's a small unit and well made. It plugs into the expansion port of the Spectrum and expands it. It has a reset button. Really useful for resetting your Spectrum. A highly recommended add-on then if you want to extend your port and reset your computer. There, that should do it. The latest game that I completed was Aquarius by Bugbite. And it's, if you've never seen it before, it's an early 1982 thing. And it's a cross between Scramble and Scuba Dive. Now nah, I've never seen it. <laughs> So is it a side-scrolling shooter? <laughs> it, was, it is, in a, in a really bad way. You're underwater, and you've got squids and jellyfish floating about, and you've got a, a spear gun that you shoot. But there's a little twist to it, in that right at the very beginning, you're given three colour codes. Do you know like the colour codes you get with Jet Set Willie at the beginning? Yeah. You get sort of red, green, and blue, or whatever. And you have to remember those, because when you get to the end, you have to shoot the coloured blocks in the right order that you were given at the beginning of the game to actually complete it. <laughs> and, and luckily, very luckily, when I was doing it, the colour code I got was yellow, 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 <laughs> which made shooting the blocks quite simple at the end. Yeah, that's not too bad at all. Um, it's, it's, it's worth a go if you've never seen it, but I mean, it's not spectacular. I wouldn't say it's brilliant or anything. I might, I might check it out. I once made a suggestion on, on the World of Spectrum forums. Um, somebody was asking for features of an emulator, and I said, couldn't you hook into the machine code and trigger an external sound sample based on the sound effects on the game, thereby replacing the game sound effects with whatever you wanted in a WAV file. And somebody said they, wouldn't, they couldn't be able to do it, but I'm sure you'd be able to do that because that would make it even better, wouldn't it? It would, but I actually, I'm not, I don't think I understand what you're asking for there. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if you look at the, if, if you go into a debugger and look at the code, yeah. you, will, you will know when a sound effect is triggered yeah. by whatever means it be a call to an out or something like that. And if you could then, it, via the via the spectacular or whatever, call a WAV file to be played instead. Ah, so you it, could improve the sound effect. The sounds. You could get proper arcade sounds you by could, just um, replacing, well, having a set of WAV files for each game. So you could put the Defender, you could put WAV files of Defender on Jetpack. Yeah, if you wanted. That would be cool. I know. <laughs> somebody, somebody said they couldn't do it for some reason, but I think that would be really good. Got really good uh, thing for an emulator to have. Wouldn't wouldn't be easy. I, I was going to actually try and do something sort of a workaround in in uh, VB. I was going to try and write a thing that detected key presses on a keyboard. So if you press the fire key, it, it would play a sample instead of um, instead of the spectrum. Well, not instead of the spectrum sound. It just monitor the keyboard and play a sample, which would work. Except when you've got thrust keys, how would that work? And and left yeah. and right, you'd be able to do it with fire keys, I suppose. Well, you could do it for thrust keys as well, though, couldn't you? Because you just again, uh, again going yeah, back to yeah. Defender. If you were pressing thrust on Jetpack, if that thrust ended up playing the Defender thrust sound, which I think yeah. is a brilliant noise. I, I really, really like the the Defender sound. I think Defender is mm. brilliant. But you wouldn't be able to get things like explosions because the, there's no key presses for those. So that would have, that would have to be hooked into the into the code somehow. Yeah. But you could get you could do key presses, definitely. Yeah. Even that, even just jetpack instead of the kind of I mean the sounds are pretty good on jetpack, but even just jetpack with the firing sound and the thrust sound from defense would look pretty yeah. impressive. 
Well, quite simple to write a, key, a keyboard monitoring mute. Um, there's probably a few already out there. I was going to say, you can probably get one already. Mm. I might do that. I might, <laughs> that might be a project for, for me to do. We've gone off topic. Be There's, a, there's a, um, a nice... The problem with DK Tronics keyboards is there's two versions. There's one with a spacebar and one without. Um, so the version 2 is with, uh, with spacebars, and that's what I'm looking for. There's, there's a couple of version 1s on there at the minute, but I want one with a spacebar. When, when I go back to the original Spectrum now, I really miss the spacebar. Yeah. yeah. But I, I, th I do like about the Spectrum itself is the, um, the legends, the keywords on the keys, because I, th I thought that was a brilliant idea. I thought it was as well, actually. And once, you, when, once you got used to everything and where it was and how you you could get things by pressing, you know, going into extended mode, mm. then writing a basic program was a lot faster. Once, yeah, once you learned them, I, I remember. I remember having some frustrating times trying to work out well, how, how I got looking for particular commands that I hadn't used before when typing yes, things yeah. in out of magazines or a book. Actually, I remember something once. There was, um, you know, that. The greater than or equals to was a specific was separate to greater than and equals. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it looked but it looked identical. I remember typing something in and it wouldn't work and getting really, really frustrated that this thing wouldn't work and I typed I, I checked it a hundred times and it looked perfect and kept saying this line's wrong. I was like, well, why is it wrong? I've done it exactly as it is. And I think I think I remember deleting the equals and just make I'll just make it greater than <laughs> I had exactly the same thing, but with I was typing out um, a listing, and some idiot sent it into the magazine with a variable named R N D. That's capital R, capital N, capital N D, which obviously is is a function, yeah. random. And I I just typed R N D, and it, and obviously the game wouldn't work because it wanted it wanted random. Yeah. And I went round in circles, and and in the end I just I just didn't bother. <laughs> I, just, I just threw it out. I think. Because I, I couldn't figure out the magazine. It says R N D, and I put R N D in. Why is it not working? You know, R N D open brackets times ten or whatever it was. And it just said invalid command at line whatever. Anyway, back to normality. That was the end of the series. I'll be back soon with a whole new series and another ten episodes. Thanks for watching, subscribing, and commenting. And I'll see you all very soon.